top here some sugar, simple sugar. Okay, could hold it in my hand for hours and it would not burn. Yet this is the um, carbohydrate which we use for much of our energetic needs, right? So somehow this has to get burned inside our bodies. Right? So to do that, okay, it doesn't do it on its own, it doesn't get really hot in our body, that hot. Okay? We have biological catalysts or enzymes. If you guys remember, catalyst is something that makes a reaction go okay, at lower temperatures and at higher speeds than they would otherwise. Right? Also, catalysts are not used up, so they're recycled constantly. They're not used up in a reaction, they just make reactions occur. Right? So enzymes are our biological catalysts. They're very specific for what they do. Okay? Uh, one enzyme will catalyze one specific reaction. That depends on, if you remember back to proteins, most enzymes are proteins, depends on their tertiary structure. Okay? If you recall, the primary sequence of a protein is the string of amino acids, alanine, valine, glycine, and so forth. Okay, but that's going to dictate what its secondary structure is, whether it's alpha helix or that beta pleated sheet. Okay? And then that's going to, in turn, fold up into its tertiary shape, which is the most important in our, for enzymes. Okay? It's, it's, that shape is what's going to dictate what its function is. All those um, interactions between the R groups, the hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, the hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, sulfur bonds, it's going to give it a distinct shape. Okay? So just going to kind of make a little squiggly line like that because that's, it's that complex. Okay, but somewhere in there is going to be the active site of that enzyme. And that's where it's actually going to do its work, its action. Okay, so the current theory used to be, when I was going to school, was lock and key. So an enzyme worked because of its shape. Okay, is that a key works because of its shape. So it was a good uh, metaphor for it. Okay, but now it's induced fit because the, the enzyme actually does change shape a little bit. Just, so allows the reactions to uh, occur, put stress on the bonds in what is called the substrate. Okay, the substrate is what it works on. Okay, so if we we're talking about sugar, which we just had here, um, the sugar would be the substrate. And then the enzyme usually takes on that word, but then it ends at ASE. So the enzyme which breaks down sucrose would be uh, sucrase, ASE. So if you see ASE at the end of the word, it's probably an enzyme. All right, so here's the uh, induced fit. Um, Hypothesis. In this case, we are building up a molecule. Okay. We have substrate one, substrate two, and again, that's what it's working on. Okay. The enzyme, simplified here, has this active site. Okay. So you can see here, substrate one, substrate two. Uh, it's going to fit into that active site. Okay. So this is the first bar they're going to fit in. When they fit in like that, it's going to put pressure on the bonds to allow them to fit together in this case. Okay. And then the third one is the product. So it's this, in this case, we are synthesizing a new molecule. It could go the other way, though. We could have um, one thing broken down into two or more. Okay, so either way works. But the enzyme basically does the same thing. It allows them, the substrates to come together. Or if it's just one thing breaking, decomposing it, puts pressure on those bonds and breaks them up. Okay? So that's the induced fit of an enzyme. Okay. Now, a lot of enzymes have inhibitors, things that can slow them down. Okay. One is called a uh, competitive inhibitor. Okay. They compete for the active site, so you put the inhibitor in there, and the inhibitor would get into that active site and just block it. Okay. There's certain neurotoxins, like, um, which cause paralysis, uh, like snake bites, okay, which go in there and they permanently break down a a neurotransmitter, okay, block that site, which causes paralysis. Okay? So that would be a competitive inhibitor. They compete for the active site. There's also ones that are called non-competitive inhibitors. Okay, they hit what are called allosteric sites. So they would hit a site somewhere else on the enzyme. So there might be an allosteric site here, which locks in at this site, but then that causes a conformational change in the enzyme, so then the enzyme no longer works. So it basically deactivates that enzyme if you, you lock on some other spot rather than the active site. That's called allosteric. Okay. You can also have activators which work in the same way. So this site may be inactive, but then when you, you have this activator lock in here, it changes it to the active site so that it, it works. Okay. So you can have inhibitors or you can have activators. Activators work 
kind of like a uh, non-competitive in that they hit the allosteric site. All right? Some enzymes, you have to have what are called cofactors. They're the inorganic uh, substances, molecules, or um, elements which uh, activate the enzyme. Okay? So um, you uh, can have things like zinc, which is required for some enzymes, and um, manganese and so forth. So they actually get in there and they change the shape of the enzyme to make it active. Okay, there's also coenzymes, which are organic non-protein molecules, which allow enzymes to work too. Again, they fit in with the enzyme and they, they activate the active site. Okay, vitamins are a good example of, of coenzymes. Okay. Then finally, environments. Um, because we were in this active site here, which is uh, that tertiary with a lot of hydrogen bonds, you can break that site down relatively easily Okay, because um, those well, kind of weak hydrogen bonds keep it in that active site like that. So okay, when that happens, when you break those sites down, it's called denaturing the enzyme. Okay, so for example, down here, you can change the temperature. So if you have here the rate of the reaction here, the temperature here, our temperature is around 37 degrees. So say if for humans, the, um, the rate for the enzyme would be highest around here. Of course, as you get cooler and cooler, of course, Molecules are moving slower, so reactions don't occur as fast. But then, uh, going the other way, as you get hotter, you get an optimal temperature, that's body temperature. But if you go beyond that five or 10 degrees, it drops off sharply because at that point, you've denatured this active site, denatured the enzyme, so it no longer works. So you get about 55, 50, 55 degrees, the enzyme breaks down. Okay. Same basic idea with pH. Okay, our pH is about 7, 7.2 in our body. Okay, so that's optimal pH for most reactions. If you uh, make them more acidic or more basic, again, you're gonna change the active site, the rearrangement, and you'll denature that enzyme. Uh, it turns out some enzymes, though, work better in lower pHs. So think about pepsin in your belly. You have a pH of about two there. So there's enzymes in your, in your um, stomach which actually don't work unless there's a pH of about one or two. All right, so there's